Freddie Gerson. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, I will try to get right into this. First meetings, first meetings are memorable. And of course, there can only be one first meeting by definition. But in a strange way, I figured out that I had two first meetings with Tom and Harvey. The first encounter, I'll explain, was about 55 years ago. I was then in law school, and I was bored. I was very bored, and I told my classmates I was bored. And someone said, why don't you go downtown and see the Fantastics? So I did. And it proved that to have a medicinal effect. It, it sort of was therapeutic. But more than that, it gave me a chance to get in to see something which I don't think I would have otherwise seen. And I was not seeing something. I was immersed in something. And this was a different kind of theater. And it was a world that was a pretend. It was smart. It was engaging. And there was something phantasmagoric about the whole experience. Um, I don't think it was a meeting of Tom and Harvey. I encountered a work created by Tom and Harvey, and I found out later it was imbued with Tom and Harvey. So I met them that night through their work. Also that night, I discovered that what is known in the theater as a black box remains only a black box, unless you light it up. The Sullivan Street Theater was not a black box theater. It was a real theater, but it was quite dark. It was unadorned, and um, the show played, and the theater lit up. It not only lit up, it went beyond lighting up. It sparkled. It sparkled brilliantly. And there was no giant light grid. There was no revolve. There were no smoke machines, ostrich plumes. There was nothing. There was nothing remarkable happening except without all of those things came a light. And that light came from inside the audience. They were lighting up. Their imaginations were lighting up. They were riveted to what was going on on the stage. And it was because of actors who were delivering that dialogue that had been written by these guys singing that score, playing those roles, telling that story, and supported by this vast orchestra of a piano and a harp. Well, that experience transported, teleported an audience into a stage. And when we were sitting in our seats and we weren't being teleported, what we were is overwhelmed by this this strange sensation of charm which insinuated our lives and that was, that was gossamer. There was a gentleness about everything that I was experiencing. And that kind of a night you just never forget. And that was my very first meeting, my first encounter with a Tom and Harvey-ism. So okay, fade, dissolve, fast forward 30 years and I get to meet Tom and Harvey in person for real. I get it because I buy MTI, Music Theater International, and it represents the works of authors and rights holders, and I found that I get a bonus. The bonus of the owner is you get to meet the authors. So I meet the authors, and we have our first meeting, and then I get to know them. And when I get to know them, the bell goes off for the first time that this is my second first meeting with Tom and Harvey because indeed they were charming, engaging, delightful. They were the Fantastics. They were the show. Those, they are who they are. They're always, they always are who they are. There's nothing fabricated. It's all pure, it's all honest. Those are who these guys are. Down home, Texas Originals, they don't try to be what they're not. They don't try to be anything other than who they are. That includes their high standards, their work ethic, their special sensibilities, their artistry, their talent, their crafts. When you see and hear their musicals, you know you're hearing a Tom and Harvey show. They have an identifiable voice. That's a collective voice, a voice of their musical voice, their lyric, their dialogue. Seamlessly, it's melded. 
and then it's galvanized. And when it comes back out, you hear and feel something which is not derivative, purely original, and sui generis. And it seems natural, and it seems simple. It's not simple. It's hard work. What they do is hard work. These things just don't pop up. It's not like those old movies where Mickey says to Judy, let's put on a show. That isn't how it happens, folks. You know it. Most of you are of the theater. You don't just put on a show. It is painful at times, brutal, frustrating. It takes patience. It takes passion. It takes courage and fortitude. It takes trial and error. And then there are setbacks. You dig deeper. You ask for more resilience, tenacity. You're navigating those bumpy waters of writing, testing it out, hearing it out, live readings over the years, and then finally pitching it. And you pitch, and you try, and you cast, and maybe you're getting closer to getting on the stage. And with any luck, finally, you get to that stage, and then you have to pray. And what you pray for is that the audience is going to buy into everything you've been working on for probably years. And then you have to hold your breath and pray that they're going to be riveted throughout that show. If that happens, which is the exception, it is magic. In 1962, the little show I saw at the Sullivan Street Playhouse was not only an exception, it turned out to be exceptional. Because over the course of time, 220,000 performances of that show have taken place and still get taken place. Over that period of time, 40 million people sat through that audience and were riveted and had the experiences I had or similar ones. That isn't even an exception, that's exceptional. That exceptional experience is a sociological, cultural, global phenomenon. And the authors here do not aspire to anything like that. That is a rare experience. But they keep working because they love theater and they love these ideas that come to them and they hear about something and they say, we could adapt that and make it into a musical. And they are driven to write. And when they're driven, they are bonded. And when they are bonded they, as long-term collaborators, they bond over pain, shared risks, they bond over dreams, they bond over disappointments, they soldier on, and they share this vision, creating together, and the world that they're creating in is arcane. It is not the business world. It is not, I'm going to study singing, I'm going to study dancing, I'm going to practice, I'm going to be the best, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do it. And you saw all of that, and that was terrific. But here there are no real rules. The rules are your gut. It's visceral, it's organic. You gotta feel your way through this. It's a chemistry, and beyond chemistry, it's really old-fashioned alchemy. Tom and Harvey have been doing for years what people have done before them, have done while they were doing it, and will be sti are still doing it today, and will do it in the future. They take the spoon and they stir the pot. They take a taste, they think about it, they look at it, and they make an adjustment. They put in a new flavor, a new tone, a new seasoning. They take a song out. A song goes back in. They write a new song. They change a character. They want to make the story work. They try it again as another reading. And this is the process over and over and over again. So the seasoning may change, the flavor may change, but it is their taste, their person, they are putting themselves into this show, whatever that show is. The reason I describe this world of musical theater as I perceive it, as I know it, as I've been living with it, is to give you all, if you don't have it already, a little peek inside the world that Tom and Harvey have inhabited. They've inhabited this world together. They've shared it as a team for all of their adult lives. These are two men with one theatrical voice, they stick to what they know, they stick to what they believe, and then they get on with the hard work of making the show happen. So ladies and gentlemen, 
it is singularly appropriate that the Oscar Hammerstein Award, which represents a lifetime in musical theater, should go to these two good friends, these two gentlemen who have spent professional lives in tandem being creative, adventuresome, and thankfully giving all of us an opportunity to share a piece of their art and revealing to us a piece of their heart. Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt. ago, in a galaxy far away, <laughs> by which I mean the University of Texas in 1950, Harvey and I did a college musical. And to our astonishment, we, we had no desire, either of us, to be writers or composers. To our astonishment, that experience changed our lives. and gave us a direction and an enrichment to our lives. It's from a musical we worked on at uh, Portfolio, our theater workshop, a musical called The Bone Room uh, about male menopause. Bone Room, Tower, you get a theme going through. Right? <laughs> but, uh, and uh, researching that book, we read a lot of books. <clears throat> I mean, researching for the musical, and one of them was one by Jessica Mitford called The American Way of Death, all about the pleasures of dying and being involved in this great country of ours. So I have to warn you, this is a very distasteful song, but <laughs> as Al Goldstein, at that time the editor of Screw Magazine, was quoted as saying, Nowadays, it's not enough to be dirty. You've got to have bad taste, too. <laughs> so I don't know about the dirty, but I think we, we manage the bad taste part of this. <clears throat> no, no simple little coffin made of pine. No slip them in the graveyard, no siree. For now, no, when you, you are, are finished, you, you recline in an open vault for everyone to see. I could see you lying there, someone must have shampooed your, your hair. Isn't that a wonderful way to die? It ought to make you happy, all dolled up and looking cute, stuffed into your new Sunday suit. Isn't that a wonderful way to die? Wonderful 
Way to Toho Who Fly.